morning, I'm Katie Cottingham. Welcome to this news briefing from the 252nd National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Philadelphia. We're joined today by Dr. Jeff Cunningham from the University of South Florida. He will be talking to us about recycling rechargeable lithium ion batteries with fungi. Dr. Cunningham? Thank you. Um, we became interested in this project because uh, everybody walks around with one of these in their pocket now. Um, mobile phones, laptops, um, all run on rechargeable batteries. And it's expected that uh, electric vehicles will likely also start using the same type of battery technology, um, which is a, a lithium ion battery. And sort of the active ingredient in the uh, rechargeable batteries that we all use is lithium cobalt oxide. So the two uh, key elements um, involved in these batteries are lithium and cobalt. Um, lithium currently is in pretty plentiful supply, but a lot of the projections say that as the worldwide demand continues to grow for these types of rechargeable batteries, we're going to start uh, running into um, more depleted supplies of, of lithium and potentially cobalt. Furthermore, these elements are mined in only a few locations in the world. Um, so we want to sort of ensure that there is a sustainable supply of lithium and cobalt to put in these devices. Furthermore, um, these batteries don't last forever, and when the batteries are done after maybe 10, 15 years, we don't want those batteries to just end up in a landfill or an incinerator. So for all these reasons, we want to be able to recycle the lithium and the cobalt out of these batteries and uh, put them to beneficial reuse. There are methods to do this already, um, but the methods that exist currently often use uh, harsh environments, harsh chemicals, and so we're looking for a method that would be environmentally friendly and uh, hopefully cost effective. Well, it has to be cost effective to be commercially viable. And so we're interested in using uh, fungi to try to extract the lithium and the cobalt out of batteries when they reach the end of their lifetime. Um, this occurred to us because fungi have been used to extract valuable metals from other solid waste streams, uh, spent refinery catalysts, fly ash, um, uh, other electronic scrap. Um, so we sort of thought, well, if it works in those applications, it probably ought to work as here as well. So we've been looking at three different fungal strains. Um, we've been testing how they grow. We've been testing what acids they generate when they grow. And we've been testing how well those acids can extract lithium and cobalt from crushed battery cathodes. Um, Generally speaking, it works. Uh, we think there is room for improvement. Um, so we have a number of things that we're still working on to try to improve the process. Um, but we think that uh, at this point, there's no reason why it doesn't look uh, scientifically viable. We, we don't know yet uh, how the economics are going to work out. Um, but from a scientific standpoint, uh, fungi work pretty well in terms of producing acids that are able to extract lithium and cobalt uh, out of crushed battery cathodes. Okay, so are there any questions? Please wait for the microphone to come and state your name and affiliation before asking a question. Kath? So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, I guess the first question is to ask why you need to use fungi at all. I understand that you've, you know which acids are responsible. Why can't you just use the acids to extract the metals? Yeah, so the, the acids are commercially available already. We could buy oxalic acid, we could buy citric acid. Um, we, we think that um, using the fungi to produce them, uh, we're, we're hoping is going to be more cost effective. Um, that if they produce the, fun the acids for us, um, then we're sort of uh, uh, eliminating the middleman. Um, and that, that we hope will be more cost effective. But I, I have to admit, we, you know, we, we don't know that at this point. It's going to depend on how, efficient, um, how efficiently they produce the acids, but that's the hope. Okay. Why do these particular fungi actually um, recycle these metals in nature? What's the, the advantage for them? <laughs> um, that's an excellent question. I, do, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I, I wish I could answer that for you. So these fungi, as, as they grow, they naturally produce uh, these acids. They make their environment uh, more acidic as they grow. Um, it, there must be a reason why they're doing that. Um, 
the the acid they must be using the acids for something presumably to uh, extract trace metals from their environment. Why are they doing that? Um, I I don't know the answer to that. I um, I'll have to ask our, our mycologist uh, if she can answer that question the, for us. The release also mentions that maybe the, the metals might be to I suppose toxic to the fungi to, in, to some extent as well. Do you know anything more about that? I mean, how much of this metal can they tolerate? Uh, that's yeah, excellent question. So that's sort of next on our list to to be looking at because. Um, my hypothesis is that cobalt is going to be toxic to these uh, to these fungi. So as they extract the metals, um, they are making their environment more toxic. Um, in previous bio leach fungal bioleaching experiments, what's been observed is that the the fungi uh, develop a tolerance over time, um, so that you can sort of um, get them used to their environment. Uh, I, I don't know if that's better characterized as an adaptation process or an evolution process. I'm not exactly sure what's uh, happening biologically, but we do know that the fungi can become more tolerant over time. So that initially their growth is inhibited uh, by the presence of these metals, but that uh, as they get used to their environment, they again learn to, to grow um, even in the presence of these metals. And interestingly, uh, and somewhat paradoxically, uh, some studies have shown that the acid production actually tends to increase in the presence of these metals that are somewhat toxic. Um, so we're, we're hoping that once the fungi become used to the environment, it, it might even result in more acid production and better performance, but we haven't tested that yet. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Ben? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ben Valsler, Chemistry World. Um, the press release mentions that the change in acid concentration you've measured over 48 hours. How long does it actually take for these, uh, these fungi to extract the, the metals themselves? So the, the longer you give them, uh, the better job that they do. Um, so that in order for this process to be commercially viable, the, ex the kinetics of the extraction process have to be fast enough. Um, if it takes you know, weeks of contact time, then you would need to have a, a giant reactor in order to get out useful amounts of lithium and cobalt. Um, so we will be uh, investigating the kinetics to make sure that, um, that the kinetics of the extraction um, are fast enough. The, the acid production is, is rapid. Um, the pH in the environment starts to drop almost immediately as soon as the, so that the fungi grow rapidly and they produce acids rapidly. So that's the good news. But then the next part of that is how rapidly do the acids extract the target metals from the uh, crushed batteries? Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I, I can't answer that fully yet. Um, we know that the, the longer you give them, the better that they do, um, certainly within, within days, uh, but I think we need to, um, in order for the, the process to be uh, economically viable, my guess is we would need contact times of hours rather than days, um, and I, I don't know yet whether or not uh, we can engineer the conditions to, uh, to be able to extract the lithium and the cobalt over the, the time scales that we need. And in what form is the lithium and cobalt then left to you in solution? Is it, is it elemental? Has it been ionized? Do you need a, a reduction stage after that to get back to something you can use? Uh, yes. So we will need uh, another process. Once the, uh, the lithium and the cobalt are extracted into solution um, in, in an ionic form, um, then we will need um, some sort of a process to get them out of the liquid solution. Um, I spoke about this work in, yes, in a session yesterday here at the ACS meeting. There were a number of other uh, speakers in the same session who were looking at different methods to uh, get rare earth elements out of liquid solutions. So there were a number of very interesting technologies that people were discussing. Um, th the other speakers were not looking at lithium and cobalt. They were looking at um, slightly more exotic uh, rare earth elements. But there are a number of uh, technologies that people are investigating to be able to get um, metal ions out of liquid solution. So I think um, we don't know yet what the best process will be to do that, but there are a lot of candidates out there. And uh, speaking of, of sort of partnering up with other people who are doing parts of this, uh, are you considering looking at the genetic pathways and possibly going as far as to engineer an ideal fungus that could do this in the time that you need for it to be commercially viable? 
Well, I, so I'm, I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, my co-PI is uh, Dr. Valerie Jody Harwood, um, also at the University of uh, South Florida. She's a biologist. Um, she's, she's not a mycologist. She works more with bacteria, but she's a biologist. What we are looking at currently is whether or not we can uh, try to um, provide conditions during the fungal growth stage that will steer the fungi towards uh, production of the more preferable organic acids. Uh, they make about five different types of acids that we've been able to identify. Um, th they make a lot of gluconic acid. Unfortunately, gluconic acid is the least effective acid for actually extracting lithium and cobalt um, out of uh, spent batteries. The other acids that they produce, uh, like citric, oxalic, malic, tartaric, are more effective. So what we're, one of the things that we're working on is trying to figure out how can we produce the right conditions, so both select the right strain and um, provide the right conditions that would steer the fungi towards producing um, the more preferable acids. We have not thought at all about um, actually trying to change the genetics of the fungi, but we think that by selecting the right fungi and by providing the right conditions, uh, we might be able to somewhat optimize the process. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Kath? <laughs> so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, the release also mentions that other researchers are using fungi already um, to recycle electronic um, parts. Can you say a little bit more about that and how that compares? Right, so that's sort of how we got the idea for this, is, is we saw in the literature that, um, that fungi have been used to look at um, uh, what spent refinery catalysts is one that we've seen frequently in the literature because you know, these uh, catalysts also involve a number of ex expensive and interesting metals. Um, once the catalysts reach the end of their lifetime, um, we want to be able to get the metals back out of those uh, catalysts. So uh, that's sort of how we came up with the idea is that we saw that fungi had been used for those types of applications previously. And the, the reason we picked the three strains that we picked, uh, we're looking at uh, Aspergillus niger, Penicillium chrysogenum, and Penicillium simplicissimum as the three fungi that we're currently investigating to, to hopefully do this, this job for us. The reason we picked those is because those were the strains that we saw in published literature that had been most successful in previous applications for things like um, electronic scrap um, and catal uh, catalyst, uh, refinery catalysts. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the metals that we've seen uh, in the literature. Uh, nickel, vanadium, um, I think gold, I'll have to check on that. Um, so there are, have been a number of metals, a number of different types of solid wastes that have, um, people have used fungi for bioleaching in the past. But the press, ah, so, because I thought the press release said that the other methods didn't use bioleaching, so they also do use the acids, do they? Is, is that right? Yes, yeah. yes, that's, oh, okay. that's, the, that's the idea is, um, it, is that, again, they're using these, the same strains of fungi um, th to produce acids that then, uh, leach these metals, and, and in published literature, um, we've seen, and depending on the particular um, metal and the particular type of solid waste stream, um, sometimes upwards of 95% of the metals are able to be uh, leached back out by the fungi. So we're, um, we have not yet seen those same levels. We've been getting maybe 40 to 80% of the lithium and the cobalt, um, but we're hoping that uh, with, with some continued work, we might be able to get the same types of um, successful levels that, that we've seen in, in other applications with fungal yeah, biology. I wondered why the cobalt was so much lower. You seem to get, it's, it's less than 50% with the cobalt, where it's quite high with lithium. I mean, um, is there a particular acid that works better for um, cobalt, or is there a way of kind of increasing that cobalt level? Um, yeah, so the, the lithium, um, one of the reasons we can get such a high level of the lithium is it turns out that uh, oxalic acid is particularly good for getting lithium out. Um, other than gluconic, uh, the other four uh, biogenic acids uh, seem to perform about the same for, for cobalt, um, and they're all sort of around 40% uh, from what we've seen so far. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. I don't yet know the chemistry of, of why particular acids are are more effective. Um, I don't know the details of the the chelation process. That's one of the things we'll be looking at. Um, I'll be looking to see what uh, what's in the published literature in in terms of um, uh, how effectively we know the different acids uh, chelate with these metals. Um, so I, I I don't yet know um, can can we uh, sort of pick a, a winning acid um, or or try to engineer the conditions to improve the cobalt um, in the short term the cobalt is likely to drive the uh, the economics um, so it's pretty important to Im increase our cobalt extraction efficiency currently cobalt is much more valuable than lithium um, I'm guessing that in a couple decades that might not be the case um, based on the, the rate at which um, these rechargeable batteries are going into pretty much everything. Um, but under, for, for, for the short term, uh, cobalt is more valuable and will sort of drive the economics. So we definitely want to try to improve that cobalt extraction efficiency. Thank you. Okay, we have a, an online question um, from Christine Sa, Office of Public Affairs. She's asking how much fungi does it take to recycle one smartphone battery, for example, and what will it take to scale this up? Good questions. Um, so the this the the scale up. There are a number of engineering issues um, regarded to things like scale up, and and also one of the questions that was asked previously about okay, once the uh, metals are in solution, then what? Um, so those types of engineering questions, we, we really are not um, thinking about, well, we're thinking about them, but we're not doing anything about them um, yet. In terms of the fun, how much fungi we would need to recycle one smartphone battery, um, let's see, let's think about that. Um, the fungi, if, if we inoculate with just one milliliter of a, of a sort of spore suspension into 100 milliliters, we can ver the fungi grow very rapidly up to around 10 grams per liter. So they grow very, very fast, and they produce acids in concentrations of um, between 10 to 100 millimolar. So starting with just one little drop of uh, spore suspension, we can very rapidly get to the uh, get to a point where we're producing 100 millimolar of of um, these different acids. Um, so from that standpoint, I think we we don't need a lot of fungi to produce a lot of acid. Uh, that's the good news. Um, but the um, in in terms of the engineering issues of how are you actually going to build the reactors? What will the reactors actually look like? How, bi how big how big will the reactors actually be uh, to perform this on a commercial scale? Um, we're we're really not ready to think about those things yet. At this point, we're just trying to understand uh, the um, how how well the, the fungi perform. Um, a little bit about the chemistry and the biology, and then the engineering issues and the economic issues will uh, will come later on. Other questions? If not, thank you very much for coming. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live Philadelphia. Please join us for our next press conference today at 1115 on edible food packaging made from milk proteins. Thank you. <laughs>